I'll share the Thursday night scene with you. It's down <laughs> yes. at the caravan park. So we're calling uh, at Adelaide Oval. They've got, they've hooked a sheet up over the side of the caravan. They've got a projector beaming the footy onto the sheet and they've got SEN sync going. They're all sitting around in their hoodies and blankets. There's 17 of them in all. And the others at the caravan park sort of all gather around to share the experience around the esky. <laughs> <laughs> That's gather around. That's proper gathering. Yeah, I don't know if it's the five-star or com that you're sort of track, <laughs> you're rocking with at the moment. But um, no, it wasn't an amazing weekend. Yeah. It wasn't terrific. I mean, everyone talks it up and I think you just have to get there. If you're a footy lover... You just have to get there because the amount of access to your favourite players or your coaches, they're just everywhere. It's just so casual. It's just accepted that you're going to have to, you're going to, have to talk to people that are in the industry if, if you're in it. And if you're just a fan, the, the kids were getting so much joy out of just walking the streets. Yep. It was terrific. Yep, it's a unique and beautiful addition to the, uh, to the fixture. All right, give me the King's Gambit to get us underway. Well, I just was having a look at the uh, at the star factor players in, in our league at the moment. We always talk about it being a star driven league, and never has that been uh, clearer and more available to stars. We don't tag anymore. We you can put those magnets where you want, and because it's such a a, a structural and systematic based game now, you can you can manoeuvre the pieces to get what you want. You you can get Toby Green standing by himself off stoppage. You can get Jeremy Cameron running through the middle of the ground unopposed. You, you can get Isaac Heaney in, in its inter-bounces and now he's just become a star. So you, you, if the coaches have got the ultimate control with their, with their magnets now, right? So when you look at the top 10 rated players in the competition right now, there's a, there's a, there's a theme. Heaney, Petrarca, Raul, Bontempelli, Sarong, Butters, Horn Francis, Tom Green, Luke Jackson. Now there is one exception and that is uh, James Warple from the, from, the, uh, from the Hawks who's had a fantastic start to the year. So these are the selections in the national draft for those players. Heaney was a zone selection, so not even in the draft, right? So he was an academy boy. Petrarca picked two. Rao picked one. Bontempelli, four. Sarong, eight. Butters, 12. Horn Francis, one. Tom Green, 10. Luke Jackson, three. The Warper was a pick 45, so forget him for a minute. If you don't have these elite picks and you don't nail these elite picks in terms of getting those selections right, then you are miles off the base. So when, when I look at these players and their influence on games, it's profound. And then when you talk about, okay, well, how do we, how do we, what happens when you bracket them together? So when you start watching games now, right? I, did, I did the Sydney and the West Coast game, Heaney, Warner and Goulden, you know, two academy kids and Warner was picked 39. So what a steal he, he's been. But they just, they just going crazy. They're just running right. Raul Anderson Miller, pick one, two and 29. Petrarca, Oliver Viney, two, four and father, son. Butters, Rosie, Horn, Francis, 1, 5, and 12. Well, how do you compete with this? So I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, well, what do you do if you're, what do you do if you're mid-table? Well, how do you get access to top eight, top five, top five picks? Well, you have, you've got no other choice. Because whoever you talk to talks about the draft now being so poor beyond sort of pick 30 that it's, it's almost a nonsense. It's so speculative and the returns, um, I'd like to see the strike rate on, on the returns of picks north of 30 in the last sort of six or seven years because it would be pretty low, I reckon. And then we talk about Walsh coming back into that Carlton midfield that will have picks one, Cherry at five, and Cripps at 13. So we're talking about just those absolute top-end class players coming back in is, is really positive. So I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking of Hawthorne. How do they get access to those picks, apart from just getting one because you finished down, you know, in the bottom two or three teams. You've got to get multiple high-end picks. So the nonsense the AFL go on with, oh, we're going to give a priority pick, which it's pick uh, 23. A waste of time. You've got to trade these two picks. We're going to give you 18 and 32. What's it matter? You know, we get a Griffin Logue or you get, a, you, you get someone of that, of that ilk. It doesn't, it doesn't change your list. It has no bearing on because they don't have influence. The players of influence are, the, are those guys. So I look at the dogs. Are you regenerating? Are you going again? Because you've got, you've got enough, but Bontempelli and Sanders, and then, and then it's what? Libba's at an age where he's doing it now, but are you winning the flag this year? If you're not, you've got to make decisions. English, Bailey Smith, do you purge a Caleb Daniel or Jackson McRae? Do you get anything for Dale? Do you get something for Williams? I, I, I don't know. But you've got, to, you've got to find a way 
to get picks in the top six or eight in the national draft by fair means or foul. Because there's a new team coming in and it's only going to get harder. So there's a deadline to work to. So I'm, I'm just... No one tags anymore, so they're having maximum impact. How do you get those maximum damage players on your list? That's the challenge now for, for all clubs, but those that have got them, wow, what, what, what weaponry. And then the exercise of the, sort of the weekend is to run the revisionist history over how Adelaide and Essendon have used those picks. They've had the critical mass of early picks, but how have they spent them? And if you haven't hit on those picks, yeah. um, where does that leave you? So Crouch is pick 23 and, and playing reasonable footy. Dawson's a pick 56 and, and has had a pretty, you know, very good last sort of 24 months. Um, but he's coming up against those one, two and three picks. And then you've got Laird, who's a rookie pick, so has had a pretty good patch in the midfield, but nominally he's a halfback flanker. So you can make do, and that's what they're doing. They're making do. But you, you, how far does that take you? So I'll, I'll look at Adelaide and I'll look at Matty Nix and I'll say, well, give Matty Nix the magnets that Ken Hinkley's got. And I'm telling you, he'd be a super coach. I'm t- I just know it. I see it, right? And I understand that others will say, oh, that's rubbish because he's, you know, he, he's, had, he's had four or five years or whatever it is. But they come, these rebuild coaches, Jared, they don't survive. So th- th- this is the discussion. How do, you, how do you then, as a coach, put those players in prime roles that influence game day? And this is why we always come back to Chris Scott. We always come back to Chris Scott. They got beaten by two players on the weekend, the Dogs. They got beaten by Jeremy Cameron, who they allowed to have 30 touches, roaming up and down the ground, 12 score involvements, and Grian Myers, who's become a sensation in our game. So they, they're allowed to do whatever they liked, unopposed. They get through a zone or they get through a grid or, they, you know, there's responsibilities, there's systematic responsibilities, but no one plays on them. So I, I look at it and I go, well, what, what are you doing with Norton, who, who they've targeted 10 times for the year? Why can't he go and play on Jeremy Cameron? Surely he can go forward, back, mid with, with him. They're the same player, aren't they? They've got, they've got uh, Darcy and Jamara down forward going really well. Um, this is not a dig at, this is not a dig at Beveridge. This is, this is just coaching. How do you get your prime pieces in the roles of influence? And if you're not, you're getting what you deserve. Was there an element of the showroom that was going on in the Adelaide Hills? Oh, what about that? So this was the best game yet between the Giants and the Suns, wasn't it? Yeah, and, and, and I'd like to know your opinion, right? because we all, we all have the Giants up there right now for this year. I'm telling you, the Suns are hot on their heels. They are, they are 24 months from just going bang. And, and I know that people say, oh, you've said this for 12 months. I thought they'd make the finals this year, even if they kept Stuart Chu. They moved him on, they got Damien Harbick. And I think Damien gave those senior bodies a month to work. But if you fail, I'm going to the kids. And a disaster for those guys because the kids, the young ones come in, you know, Cloessi, um, Will Graham, the full forward, Jed Walton, they've all, they've all hit. They all look terrific on the weekend and we know what's already there. So it's just a matter of cleaning a few things up. Uh, they're hard to play against. They're the best defensive. Uh, we, we track different stuff and, and people are late to the party with this, but we track without the footy. So it's the component of, of not being hurt when your opposition get the ball. Right? So when, when the, their opposition have the footy, they're the best team in the comp at making sure that doesn't go on the scoreboard. Now, at the moment, it doesn't look like wins, but then they're, they're coming, and when they come, they'll come they'll come in blocks and they'll destroy the mid-table or bottom-of-the-table teams, and then they'll be away. How many first-round draft picks can you have on one field at one time? Oh, it was unreal, wasn't it? It was, uh, well, I see yours and I raise you everywhere. It was just terrific. And it's good for the comp to see these two going well. You know, when they play each other, clearly you're going to have one, one team win, one team lose. But they're on, they're on the move. And I think we're already seeing the returns of, of Damien Harwick. You know, this is, this, is, this is an exciting time to be a Suns fan. It's an exciting time to be a Giants fan. You know, this, they're just awesome to watch, terrific to watch. And um, again, it's the, it's the two or three that, that just finished the job. And this is why when you talk about Jesse Hogan getting Jesse, they've got old Jesse Hogan now, haven't they? Yeah. They've got the first, the number one big Jesse Hogan. He's, he's, he's in great shape and, and doing what Fremantle would hope he was going to do. And then now he's doing it at his, at his other club. But um, no, it's, uh, it's a star-driven league. Don't be confused by anything else. Don't, just, that sometimes we muddy the waters with system and strategy and all those things. If you can get your players of influence, those prime movers, those high-end picks, to, 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 the, to 
to play to their best, well, the competition will allow you some luxuries. And where does Harley Reid fit in that and what you saw on Saturday? Oh, that was unbelievable. That was, uh, that was amazing. So I, I'm big on tackle breakers. I've always yes. been big on. I think the best players in our game, when you, even when you even when you think back, have been uh, Greg Williams. Try tackling Greg Williams. You know you, they just shrug and shake and go. Try tackling Chris Judd, Patrick Dangerfield. You can get as far back as you like. James Heard, all all the guys that that, that are Brownlow medalists. You couldn't touch. You couldn't lay a glove on. Um, so they make you miss players. So so he's had. Uh, seven tackle busts in one game, like <laughs> 11 for the year now. Um, so what, what that allows you, and, and, and it, it draws the opposition numbers in because I see you fail, so now I have to come in. So now we're committing two players to the ball carrier. And if you get it wrong for a step as a third player, you've got, you're committing three, which happened regularly in that first half of the Eagles. The Eagles led by two, close to or 10 points at the 28-minute mark of the second quarter, all because of this guy's ability to shake tackles and to get that through ball to those on the outside who are two steps forward of the traffic to then play pure ball. Now they didn't, they should have led by four goals and that would have been an an amazing watch in the second half to see if the Swans could come back. But what he was able to do was to show a glimpse that it's happening. It's on. All right. How do you want to attack that end of game experience? Well, can we just start with it was a it was a good battle. It was a good it was a good game to watch. Uh, it wasn't a great game. It was a good game to watch. It was pretty low scoring and it was it was a lot of meaningless footy in the middle. Um, so l- let's just talk about from a Fremantle point of view. If that's the way you want to set up the game, then then that's fine, right? And we're, they're going to live in this space and they like this sort of game to to, to deny the opposition their ability to play with flair and to take take some weapons off them. So that that's Justin's. Uh, mode, if you like, and that's 100% fine. Try and win the game 12 goals to eight. That's basically what they're setting up. If you're going to set the game up like that, you have to master the two-minute drill. You have to be as good as, as any other – it'd be better than any other team because most teams are trying to trying to blow the t- opposition away. They're, they're not. They're playing the control game. So when you get to this position, you can't have these errors at the end. The hit out that goes into, into vacant space, the – they're the knocking the ball into, into, into live play when you don't really want that. I, don't, I never understand why the ruckman doesn't just grab the ball out of the ruck in those instances. Because if you tackle him, it's just another ball up. Yep. It's 10 seconds gone. You don't need to be trying to create or, or to, to pass the problem to someone else. He's effectively in the ruck against Paddy Cripps. I mean, as if he can't grab the ball against Paddy Cripps. So there's just they can't be the team that loses their mind if they're setting the game up like this. But credit to them, they should have won this game. This was a game that they'll, they'll rue at the end of uh, the season wash-up when the ladder says what it says. They do a lot of things well. I, you know, I, I do love Sarong as a player. I think Fife's back in really good um, clearance form. The found one in Sharp. I mean, that, that's a smart acquisition, isn't it, to, to see him buzzing up and down the wing, holding his width, um, playing with some, some real flair. Um, but they just, couldn't, they just couldn't get the job done. Now, I think that's as much on them as a as a as a club, as a coaching group, as a methodology than it is the individual players. The Carlton side of it. So you pointed out that they've sacrificed or lost some of their stoppage game in search of something else. That was pretty graphic on Saturday as they got uh, they got monstered around the ball until right at the end when it really mattered and they won one or two clearances which were absolutely profound. So we've got to get used to Carlton becoming a, a, a different version of themselves. They're, they're a ball movement team now. Um, so they've, they've evolved. Under Michael Voss, they've evolved. So you don't often see this. I mean, normally a coach comes in with, with his mantra, his style, and his personality, and we saw it with Vossi. They just become so tough and so angry in contest and clearance. They were bashing teams over the last you know, couple of seasons. And... Um, to see to see the shift now is is real growth, so I can't wait. Now we talk about their clearance game: minus one against Brisbane, minus nine points; minus six against Richmond, minus thirty five points from clearance; minus three clearance against North Melbourne, plus eleven points; minus seventeen clearances against Fremantle. They should have the, the game should have been over minus eight points. So they they saved themselves through great backline play, um, and they got some stars down there. But when they get that right, and it'll it'll correct this, they'll, they'll regress to the mean. They'll come back to who they are. Um, and I've got no doubt Voss will be saying, "Hey, if we can find a way to find the happy balance 
between being a very good ball movement team when we need to be and, and on turnover be able to punish. Right now, I keep saying punish. So they're the third best team in the competition at getting the score returned from a turnover. So as soon as they force you into turnover, boom, it's only GWS and Port Adelaide that are better at getting it on the scoreboard. So they've got that. They've got that. And that's a great asset to have. Haven't had that over the last couple of years. So they've got that. How do you keep that and get the clearance game going? I think Sam Walsh coming back in has a, has a huge impact on that. And, and clearance is a, more often than not a one-man fix. We've seen Lockie Neal go to Brisbane, change their whole clearance profile. Pat, Patrick Dainsfield goes to Geelong, changes their whole contested possession and clearance profile. So Carlton are winning in different ways. And, and it's super exciting. I keep saying it, season of the sticks. I can see sticks going ahead, <laughs> being nominated as one of the uh, the cup bearers, Jared. Yes, yes. All right. And the ending with the ball that ricochets off Aish. Uh, umpire doesn't see it in real time. The reviews, if, if you studied immediate replays afterwards, it was all about whether it brushed his hair. The following day, we get the definitive version where it bounced off his shoulder and went to Cottrell. Uh, where do you stand in all that's going on here? I think one of the hidden beauties of our game is that we live in a bit of grey. We live in a bit of grey area. An umpire call, a non-call, um, someone always being robbed by something. Out of bounds, in bounds, touch the post, didn't touch the post. We've lived in grey area for 100 years. And I know everyone wants absolute correctness with the scoring and correctness with this. and We, 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 can, we just can't get there. And, and, and I, I don't mind where it is. You're going to have these moments every now and then. And in the end, it's an entertainment industry anyway. So the fact that we're even talking about it is part of the beauty of having these these murky things happen from time to time. I'm happy to live with it. That, that, that mark may have been paid 50 times in the history of the game, but we just don't, we don't carry on about it because the umpire calls a mark. We are, oh, what's the point? Do you, do you, do you yeah. agree with that or, yeah. or would you like a review system? No, no, no. How's our review system going at the moment? No, no. well, I'll leave that to you, but not very well, I wouldn't have thought. We, we've, we've reached a point of silliness, haven't we? So there, there's the there's the bracket of reviews which are totally useful and try to get you to the best possible outcome. And there's the small number that are correcting really bad decisions, which have been a bit worrying through the first four rounds. Uh, but then there's the... Goal umpires lost have their nerve reviews, which are happening at the moment, which is just a really strange place to get to. When, when we have our next retro round, can we not do the score review for the whole <laughs> round? Just back in the goal umpire because they've lost confidence too. Haven't yeah, they? yeah. They don't want to be the reason the game's decided. I mean, that mark to was it Stengel? As yeah. It was, well, the discussion of when you make contact with the ball as to when you control the ball for a mark for it to be paid a mark. We've never paid the ball hitting hands as a mark. Never. It's you have to control the ball, you know, through a fist. You know, sometimes someone's trying to spoil the ball, but you have to maintain control of the ball before it's a mark. Not when it first touches the hands. That can't be right, can it? No. So this is the technological creep. This is how the system is being used, and this was arc intervention in this moment. The players knew the mark wasn't taken in the field of play. The umpires knew it wasn't ta taken in the field of play. But you could use the GoPro on the far goalpost shooting through the next goalpost to try to come up with a depiction of the ball, all of the ball not being over all of the line. Is that that's that's fairy tale stuff. Now that is how the system is being used. We saw that with Max Gorn at the MCG in the Bulldogs game. All the players knew it was well over the line. But you can come up with an angle that says, Oh no, this is marked vaguely in the field of play and pay it. That so that's the overreach of technology. And we've got those who are pushing for more technology in different aspects of the game. Is nah? Is we're in a really strange spot with it. And every sport goes through this. Is you you edge in, and then you overreach with technology, and then you you want to slavishly be devoted to it. The technology is very rarely equipped enough to give you the answer except for tennis is the exception to all of this. But even behind the scenes with tennis, they'll say, what you see is not literally true. It's just the convention that everybody agrees to and you can get the depiction. So no, is the, the, the more you allow technology into the game, the more uh, grey and weird stuff you create. And we're in a really weird spot with a score of you right now. Let's just live in grey. Let, let's in be grey. happy with grey. Shall we debate last night's 
game Collingwood and Hawthorne, which that was mm. a wild ending. The debate for New Vision Clinics, New Vision Clinics, Keyhole Laser Vision, Next Generation Technology. How how do you want to read into what transpired the here? Well, let's accept that Craig McRae's made change. That they've certainly looked at the way they're playing. It's so it's been so aggressive, and and I keep saying teams have worked them out. It's you never absolutely work a team out, but you know what the the signatures of that team are. Got to tag the galley on the wing line. Got to deny them corridor. Got to do this. Got to do that. Can't let them wave run. If we can take their half back punish game off them, we we can win this game. Simple as that. So th- that's happened. Now some people don't want to don't want to believe that or under, under um, or endorse that. That that's their lot, right? We're here to talk about what we see and what we know. Yesterday, Collingwood scored five times out of their defensive half. Five times, ten points. That's like their fifth lowest in 80 games. And they would have lost three of the other five games. So they've had, what, 75 opportunities with the footy to score five times. That's not Collingwood. So what they what they were doing, they weren't kicking long to the point of the square. They were going wider than that. Get numbers there. Try and, try and just surge the ball forward. Get it in their forward half. Hit the pockets. Not the top of the square like they normally do. Hit wide and then press. Lock the ball in be difficult to play against. Now, we've seen that model with lots of other teams who want to play the forward half game, probably most notably Melbourne. So maybe they're thinking, hey, we've got to evolve with the game. Let's see what other teams are doing. Let's see what's working. And let's evolve with the game. So they win win the game of footy. Okay, there was a scare late. But when when you bring a new mode or a new method in, often you lose that game trying to, you know, just iron out a few bugs. So I think in the end it's a pretty good win. And a pretty good coaching performance from Sam Mitchell to make significant change at half time to give his team a chance. So all preseason he'd wanted Hardwick to play forward, and then they got all the wrong injuries at the wrong time. And at half time, it, it was it was just time to deploy it, regardless of what happened at the other end. And it it paid significant dividends. Is he looked every inch? You know, every you see a player go down there and go, oh, yeah, that's that'll never work. Hardwick looked every inch a forward. Hmm. He looked like Lee Matthews for about 20 minutes, <laughs> didn't he? I thought, what's going on here? So they targeted him six times in the second half. He took five marks. So this is the wrestle, isn't it? So how, when you get an injury, and, and, and the maturity of this player to be able to handle this move too. You've done the full pre-season as a forward, then all of a sudden you go back for the first few rounds. Then you, and you play on the opposition's best. You don't just go back to be a counter-punching, free-wheeling, half-back flanker. You play on the oppo's best. To be able to handle that flipping game, I think it's it's a credit to Blake. I mean, this is a tough thing to do. We've seen a lot of players get lost um, for weeks after being thrown around a little bit. Um, so this is something I think you have to stick with. I mean, you get a four-goal return. You've only kicked 11. He's done it in a half of football. It probably should have been five. He missed probably one of his easier opportunities. Um, so great return, great coaching, good innovation to, to try this with this, this player, knowing that he played as a forward as a junior and kicked bags of goals. Mm. So let's get used to seeing him there um, and hopefully the, the, the Hawks can give him some supply and service. Do you think at the end, so McDonald had the shot that you want, is they got the winning shot inside the 50, player in space and balanced up. I just wondered, so from 38 points down at half time, you know, meritorious performance, particularly with a makeshift team that they had, do they leave frustrated that they, they, they didn't steal the prize? Probably, and, and you, you'd rather be the team chasing, you know, chasing than, than trying to hang on. It's a lot, it's it's all it, it all goes wrong when you're trying to hang on, and it all goes right when you're chasing. So, I, I thought the biggest error was Scrimshaw has the ball in his hands. He's a left footer. He's a ten and a half forward. He can wrap around. Look, all left footers wrap around and drive that. He had Newcomb back where the ball would just come from as a, a received play. The one thing he couldn't do was dump the ball on his right foot. His, his non-dominant foot and have it surge out of bounds. That's the one thing he couldn't do. They were in corridor, full uh, forward 50 open and available if there are players to, to hit. So he had to take the greater risk. He had to die trying to win that game. And and he, he didn't understand the situation and, and panicked a little bit under, under moderate pressure. Time pressure, yes. Situational pressure, yes. But he didn't have, an, he didn't have the heat on him that he hasn't lived with for his previous 100 yep. games. Yep. And the Ginnivan soap opera, which was a oh, big part of the build-up. Here are the coaches in the aftermath. <laughs> He's a 
had a fantastic start to his time in brown and gold. I'm loving the way he's playing. He's scoring goals. He's creating pressure. He's helping us lock it in the front half. He's you know working really hard in the game. And the out side narrative is fascinating for the world um, but he's a really important player for us and I thought he had a he had a good game today and it would have been I mean he's 21 years old you think about the scrutiny that you know a lot of it obviously he's um, been a part of but he's had an enormous amount of scrutiny and so for him to go back and kick our first goal and to be a strong performer I was I thought his level of maturity today was was going to be challenged and some people said to me, oh, how do you think he's going to handle it? And I mean, you're a 21-year-old under that much scrutiny, how do you know? And I thought he was, I thought he played another really good game for us. Yeah, you could probably write the script on that one well and truly before the game tonight. You know, the fact he got a high free kick and a goal was always going to happen, wasn't it? Now we got great love and respect for, for Guinea. Um, I'm not sure if we play him again, so we wish him the best for the rest of the year. What would the WWE do? They would have had the first interaction that Ginnivan was a part of be high and paid as a free kick and kick a goal. (laughs) (laughs) It was great, wasn't it? This kid's a serious player. Let's not get consumed by the fact that he he either does or doesn't draw free kicks. He's always got the ball in his hands. So I think as a half forward or small forward, let's respect what he's got. I I just, my, my, my question mark with the Hawks and Sam Mitchell is don't become Matty Nicks. Don't don't think that this list is all is, is okay and you'll roll on and you'll we've got close again and you know Ward at pick seven Butler at pick twenty three McDonald Connor McDonald twenty six are they are they the drivers are they the ones we we're talking about earlier Cam McKenzie at seven Weddle at eighteen are they are they the torchbearers Nick Watson you know he's obviously injured at the moment but small forward is he going to be is he the one or is it Newcomb and Day now we haven't seen Day for a little while and, and Newcomb's just sort of trying to get himself going. He was okay again yesterday, did some things. But they, they are going to find a way. They've got to be clever and they've got to get high-end first-round draft picks in, Jared. Not one or two. They've got to try and get five or six in three to four years. I don't know how they do it. The open question is, well, there you, there you go. In-game coaching. <laughs> what do you give your players, David King? A game won by the pit crew. And we talk about this regularly. You know, what what, have you, what intelligence have you got behind the main man that can throw up solutions, not ideas? This is a problem. How do we fix it? Boom. Get it done in real time. That's why they pay the big bucks for Ross Lyon. So in simple terms, not getting the ball close enough to goal, not getting it deep enough so the opposition has to go through all 18 players on the way back. So in the first half, they get they get two points from their forward half game. In the second half, they get 22. Now, in a game like that, where you win by seven points, that's enough. So you challenge Richmond to just bite off too much, to, to actually have to have to function at a level that they're, that they're not capable of right now. They're not gifted enough in terms of the talent pool to get that job done. So, great coaching. Not a lot of not a lot of teams would have got out of that hole. Shea Bolton, he he was he he put him to the sword. I mean, that's one of the great games for the year for me. I thought he was brilliant. Yep. You know, his, his ability to finish. Yeah, he, again, given some luxuries with how teams need to play with their structural side. So, so he gets out the back when he wants to. He, he hits up when he wants to. Um, he works right up the field and then gets back. He's free. He's always free on 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 uh, counter punch. But his ability to finish is the difference. He, he was tremendous, Jared. And in the end, it's a big win from the Saints. You know, foreign venue. You can make a lot of excuses in the post match for for losing this one. Um, but but it was an important win for for our boys, the the uh, the Red Dog. Yes, yeah, so, and he spoke about the spluttering midfield. So you put the, the eight quarters together, good first half against Essendon, poor second half, with which Ross thought they were culpable for, and then poor first half, they correct their second half. So they, they haven't found consistency and dependability in the early phase of their season. And you're, it's a good win because it would have been a terrible loss. Terrible. It would have been one of those ones that, uh, in the end, would be the difference between you making the eight or not. Is that big a win? So their midfield, and everyone's talking about the Adelaide Crows midfield, how it's it's got no damage. It's vanilla. We called it vanilla a while back, you and I. They're, they're not far off Adelaide's in terms of turning a, a, a one stoppage into a score. They're very poor. They're, they're a blunt knife in there. And I think he needs to look at that, Ross. Too much trust in the same player. So maybe you have to ex- explore Nasiah, Wanger, Miller, and maybe you have to look more at Sinclair in there than, than, than the stocks, the that are in there at the moment and see if you can get creative. The, the venue. So it was, this was Jack Steele uh, in the immediate aftermath of the game. I'll be 
honest with you, so it doesn't really feel like an AFL game. Um, it feels like a sort of a bit, bit of a pre-season game, bit of community series game. Yeah. Obviously, there's four points on the line, so you get reminded of that pretty quick. And Saul and Caulfield was uh, rabid this morning. It's an absolute disgrace that the AFL played games at Norwood Oval. The dimensions of the ground are so out of whack with what is reasonably expected for an AFL ground. It makes the game terrible as there's no space. And because it isn't up to TV broadcast, it's terrible on TV. The AFL needs to do better. Um, mm. There are compromises made in a round like this. Is, is Norwood one of them? Uh, let's just wear it. I mean, it's terrific if you're there. Terrific. So that, that that text that's come through would be someone that's watched it on TV and you, you're entitled to your opinion. But the theatre of it when you're there is actually quite special. So let's just give up that it happens, what, twice for the year? What, do we play two games the other weekend? Yep. Surely we can live with that. And it's on – so from what Jack said, that's on St Kilda to ga – Gather Round is not a – it's not country week – this is a heightened stage. This is showpiece football. You want to feel that so that when you run out on the ground, it doesn't feel like a community series game. Is You want that sense of occasion and elevated theatre to have seeped through the group. So I sort of listen to Jack Steele and go, all right, O'St Kilda, you'd want to address this next year and understand what this is rather than just sort of rolling from the bus into a country ground and, uh, and, and making it up. The way the game's played at AFL level is totally different to the way it's played at local level. So sometimes when you throw the game back into these venues and you, you shake the systematic game that is AFL now, you shake it back to something that what, what the fan actually watches most weekend, their local product, their kids play, their mates play. I don't think that's a bad thing. Here they are at Norwood playing like we play, <laughs> not how they normally play at the MCG or Marvel and these beautiful you know, surrounds. It's a throwback. B bad luck. We used to play at Optus Oval, now Vizzy Park, Icon Park. Yeah, we used to play this. It's a different ground to the MCG. Of course it is. You adjust. You get on with it. It's not an excuse. It, that's I. I think um, I think Jacob won his time again there with with those with those comments because. Uh, you know, it, the game's about the fans. I'm sorry. You know, I'm, I don't know whether the Essendon Edge has any validity or it's the tooth fairy, you know. Do you, do you believe in it or not? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know because I, yes, I sort of was warming to it last week. Thought, okay, we've got, they got they got something they want to hang on to as a, as a, as a, a group. And I love the leadership of Merritt. So I'm, I'm sort of torn a little bit when you see that performance. You think, wow, how can you be... How can you be glowing of his leadership when then they throw in that? But sometimes it's harder as one man leading this group than, than others, you know. He's, I feel a bit sorry for him. But I think we start we start with there's too many at Essendon that can have games that are just zero games and give you that just give you nothing. Like not not even a five out of ten. Like they just give you a one or a two out of ten. And you think, wow, is Langford out there? He's, where's Stringer? Is Stringer there? What's, what's happening with Holland? What's happening? With, what's what's Hobbs? Is Gresham there? Yeah, Gresham was. I shouldn't say Gresham. He kicked goals. He was fine. But they have too many that are that are out of the game for a long time, or have very very little influence. And and, and again, we come back to those prime picks. I know you talked about this on Saturday, and you're spot on. Those prime picks should be doing what we mentioned earlier. They shouldn't be. They shouldn't be nice performers. They should be ripping the heart out of the opposition, and that's what Brad's talking about with the Essendon Edge. Do those picks? Are, do they have the killer instinct that are going to rip the game apart? That are going to say this is us, and they don't do it as often as they should. Now I take my hat off to to Merritt because I think he does, and Dyson Heppel is trying as hard as anyone. It's not a not a lack of trying from those two. But there's too many others that fluctuate, and you can't have that. Like you can't, if you can't build consistency when you're a high-level pick or a, a, an experienced player, you, where, where are you going? So the ed, the edge is only there if they want it to be there, right? And, and I understand the logic of it, but it can't be the tooth fairy. It was interesting that they had been they'd been good in centre clearance. They'd been a good midfield team through their first few games, yeah, uh, and then. Like they ran, so Ken Hinckley deferred to the Melbourne midfield group in the immediate aftermath. But his midfield group has to has aspirations uh, and the trajectory to be the best midfield group in the comp in the in the short term. Yeah, it's a it's an unbelievable asset to have. Yeah, you know, when the game becomes four on four, you you talked about uh, last year 
would, why wouldn't you want to, the best role in football was the ruckman to these three. I mean, you th we thought it was going to be Brody Grundy, the pair of us, didn't we? Yep. Um, and what that would then look like. I mean, you've got those high end picks are hard to, are hard to stop. And, and I still think they take a step goal side every now and then. And that's probably what good players do. You know, there was, there was a couple of rundown chases from Rosie and you go, unbelievable. The narrow arrow, I'm calling him. He's just, <laughs> he's just, if he gets it, it's going through the heart of the goals. He's a swooper and a finisher. So their, their clearance damage is, is obvious for everyone to see. It's going to be a, a significant challenge for everyone because cl centre bounce clearances, not, not around the ground clearance, centre bounce clearances in isolation are a six second contest between four players from each team. And if you can, if you can smash them, like, what was it, sixteen nine? I think Might have been on the nine, weekend they got, did they get to nineteen. Nine, oh, sorry, nineteen six. Other way around, yeah, nineteen six, not sixteen nine. Nineteen six. So that that's a mauling. Yes. Um, and no matter what you try, sometimes you can't correct it. But to get four goals from centre bounds clearances is double the AFL average. Um, so that that's an asset that's going to take them a long way. Yep, and that they have to do it against the best teams as they declare themselves. So they're going to make a mess of some of those Who teams, tag? I think, in Adelaide. It's a good question. Tag? It's you a go good question. You after Rosie or Butters, or can you can you can you compete with Horn Francis? Uh, yeah. What what's your order like that? Yeah. And the best midfields challenge you in that way, don't they? If you take rank your mus rank your musketeers for me, Jared. Yeah. Three of them. Yeah. So we would. I would have had Butters until I saw that Rosie game, and he go oh, okay. Uh, and then Horn Francis is the bull as he grows into it. They're just so young. That, that's the, the, the exciting part for them is they've got 10 to 12 years of prime football to play together, and this is just the start of it. So this, this is why we talk a lot about Ken Hinckley, okay? And, and, and this, this talent um, glut, if you like, in the middle of the ground, it gives you the best opportunity to win it, doesn't it? I know we're talking about winning it a long way out, we're, we're, but we're all talking about the premiership and why why you can win it. So their their resources are significant, aren't they? They've they've, they've fixed their backline needs over the in one off season. They've got what they want up forward, and now this midfield is like I said, it's going to rip the heart out of a lot of teams. So go and win it, Ken. This is the year. Just go and win it. Yeah, they're now properly stocked for a run at it. it is, we had slightly differing views last year. I thought he was getting the most out of the list with the deficiencies they had down back and they were still trying to make it up. That, that they are well set now. I, I still half worry a little bit about their forward setup. Is I, I don't know whether I don't know how much Charlie Dixon's got left in him and then the other pieces, I'm not absolutely sure. But, yeah, they have solidified the defence. They are ultra in the midfield. And now they've got to get it on the scoreboard. So this is this is the time. It's, it opens up from here. You know what? I thought. I thought. Just let's just leave the Jeremy Cameron discussion aside for a sec. I thought it was a bloody good game of footy. Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, like, and Bevo's right. I think we're all quick to come at Bevo because he's in this he's in this vulnerable position right now. But but I. I'm a subscriber. I think that what he does sometimes is quite clever and, and we don't recognise it in real time, only in hindsight. Only in three weeks' time, we look at it, oh, yeah, he was doing this back then, you know. I think the evolution into Darcy and Jamara being this forward line is happening before our eyes. They don't kick the ball to Aaron Norton. He's been targeted 10 times in the forward 50 for the year. So, so they've got to work out what they're doing with him. Is he the Harry Mackay? Is he the second ruck? Does he, does he go and just compete around the ground and free him up a little bit? Or is he is he a different player? Why can't he be Jeremy Cameron and go and play up on a wing or go and play higher up the field? He did it through pre-season in their internal stuff and it looked terrific because they've now got those two big boppers. I wouldn't be putting Darcy in the ruck again. I'd be using you know, English or, and, and then using Aaron as a five-minute, a quarter, go and play. You know, okay, don't compete in centre bounces. We can, you can live with that. Um, so there are other options. Libba was unbelievable, wasn't he? I mean, what a game! Nineteen clearances. What a freak! Yep. I mean, have you seen a player? Has you seen a player ban? I mean, there was only what eighteen months ago that he was he was banned from centre bounces. He wasn't even a prime uh, mover in their midfield anymore. It looked like he was on the way out. So what what a, um, a recovery this has been. Bonds and Pelly and Libba were, were, were just significant. They were enormous. Um, it's just, it's just, everything's difficult in their forward 50. Like they have the contested mark to score. So I'll just look at the method. Maybe they need to go back to that more, more handball chain further up the field so that they do get the pure entry. 
But in saying that, they're against a team that give you nothing. But Geelong are the hardest team to score against when you win the ball back on turnover because they're always organised and they got elite talent back there. Let's not let's not short sell what Geelong do. So it's a big tick to kick 14 goals against Geelong. It really is. So let's not go too hard at Bevo on this one. You can't win. You don't just win because you have good games from a couple of players. There's more. There's more science to it than that. Um, but in the end, this game is separated by the ability for Grime Myers and Jeremy Cameron to do as they please and create scores. So, yes, Hawkins is being clamped, but Cameron Cameron just high up the field, streaming back at will. 12 score involvements he has. They, they only scored. So he's involved in every second score. Yep. Like, if, if, you walked, if you're walking into the ground with Bevo and you say, look, mate, today this is what the score's going to be. You're going to lose by four points, but Jeremy Cameron's going to run around unopposed all day. And, and he's going to have half of the – he's going to be involved in half of their scoring. What do you want to do? I guarantee you he comes up with a plan, right? But in game, when this is all happening and it's, you know, you, oh, what's Buku doing? Is he going with him? Is he holding off him? All right, let's just send a half forward with him. Let's just send Ed Richards with him. It, it didn't work. So you've got to have a plan for this now. And I just say the master coach, Chris Scott, gets this one. Well done. You know, like for like in talent, really, the, the two teams. And, and, and Chris comes out on top because of his ability to, to, to get his prime pieces where he needs them and them to come to the party with influence. It's time for a bit of a shuffle, I reckon, Kingy, don't Ooh, you? Are you shuffling? Oh, I think you'll be shuffling as well. Oh, yeah. I've got a small shuffle. Yeah, yeah. All right, four? N- not not unpredictable. No, four. Uh, four, Geelong for me. They make their way in for the first time for me for the year. Um, pretty strong performance, that. Pretty great. Uh, pretty good coaching. Great coaching. I've got Port Adelaide making their first appearance for wow. me at four, given what that midfield... They're going to make a mess of the middling teams in Adelaide throughout this year. I think. And you love Ken. Let's be honest. You yeah, love I've been fit. itching for them to be there. <laughs> Three. <laughs> Melbourne for me, defensively brilliant. Star factor players in the middle. They're they're going to do what you're saying about Port Adelaide. They're going to destroy teams with this midfield mix. Yeah, I've got Melbourne at three. I flirted with them being higher, but I thought no, just let them play Brisbane first. Um, Are they playing? No, I just want to see them beat Brisbane on Thursday night, and then I'd consider higher. But my one and two are, are slated to play in two rounds' time. So there's no real, there's nothing, there's no need to do anything cute here. W- which order have you got them in? Who have you got at two? Carlton at two. Um, loved the performance. Was a, was a meddling game for a while, but they got the job done when it needed to happen. And I've got the Giants at the top. Clearly, you've got different. I've got, I'm still the other way. I'm holding Carlton at one and the Giants uh, at two. I love. Love what the Giants are doing. No knock whatsoever. Carlton sit one. They're going to play in two weeks' time so they can play for the title, um, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, as Carlton looked for all the world. They were going to lose that game on Saturday afternoon and somehow found a way to win it. They needed a bit of good luck. Their real tests are in the future, but good enough to hold the number one seed for me. And, and you just think the Giants are ticking along the way they should be? Absolutely. They're, they're flying, Jared. They're flying and just getting warm against some pretty ordinary teams.